um, the presumption and assumption that all human experience is unquestionably and automatically heterosexual. Uh, it includes the pervasive assumption of the child's heterosexuality by the parents. And the result is that homosexuality is a powerfully shameful condition associated with social deviance, cultural outcast, character defect, psychological blemish that when internalized and incorporated into one's conception of selfhood and identity becomes what we, we know as internalized homophobia and constitutes what um, Yep calls a kind of soul murder. Uh, so that um, I want to kind of really conjure for you the extent of heteronormativity as much as I possibly can, which is that um, that there is an assumption in everything, everything, everywhere we go, everything on the street, uh, in the family, in all of our institutions, in every single organization that exists, that heterosexuality is the norm. And one of the things that Yet says is it's so insidious because it goes without saying. That's what makes it so insidious. There's a kind of goes without saying quality to it. Um, so, um, um, and one of the things that um, I want to sort of say that it includes things like, you know, overt shaming of homosexuality, but just also just this assumption that the family, like relatedness by blood ties is the most important kind of relatedness you can have. That's a kind of inarguable assumption, and that blood ties are the most important thing. And I. I just want to suggest that there have been other cultures and other places and other times where that's not the case, where there's other forms of kinship systems, um, where people identify what the child's sort of uh, natural inclination may be to be like a weaver or this or that and belong to a different clan, um, and that blood ties are secondary or unimportant or ties by one line or the other. So, but here in our culture, there's this uh, sense that blood ties are the most important. So, um, um, so I want to kind of like invite you to sort of hold in mind this idea, like that about heteronormativity. That the question that I want to try to talk about here is how does the heteronormative stance of the mother affect ego identified identity development of the lesbian child? So I want to invite you into the situation, into the scenario of. The mother imagining her about her baby daughter, and uh, and that her imaginings and how she perceives her baby uh, when she looks at her have a profound, profound effect on the child, neurologically, um, ego development wise, body. Fit feltness wise, that, um, that that relationship has tremendous, tremendous power. Uh, the most profound power, and it's foundational. It lays the foundation for everything that comes after it. Um, so, um, if the mother is heterosexual, and I'm just going to make that assumption here, and there are lesbian mothers, of course, and, you know, I, I, one thing I want to say is, you know, this is. This is like, as far as I know, this is the first time this, this material has been tried, tried to be talked about from this, in this way. So this is new. What I'm saying is not written in stone. It's not like the gospel. It's just um, what I want to try to offer up as a, 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 you know, some way that could be beneficial for thinking about how to work with clients and for us to do our own inner work. OK. So. Um, can I? I just had some yeah. Just yeah. Could you say your name too, like so when you speak? Well, I'm Maureen. Maureen. I was thinking that even if you did have a lesbian mom nowadays, there's a lot of you know, lesbians who are having children. But unless that person has really done some of their own work, they can be without realizing. It. I've seen it where they are, they still are coming from the perspective that they still assume that the child's going to be a straight heterosexual child. And that without meaning to, they are 
it's like the, those cultural learnings are so deeply ingrained, they don't realize that they're transmitting it. And so we can't assume that just because there's a lesbian parent that they're going to necessarily always be able to communicate a different message. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right on, Louie. That's so <laughs> important. It is so or important. Or the other way around, too, uh -huh. that a heterosexual mom may, may be enlightened enough to not necessarily come from that, purely from that training. I mean, I think it's not that likely, but you know, <laughs> 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 but we can't make that assumption 100 percent across the board. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you're right. We're more one is more likely to make it. It's a lesbian mom. Oh, she knows what she's doing. But I actually just talked to somebody today who did an extensive infant observation of a lesbian couple and their baby, and the 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 moms were, you know, smile, smile, smile. You know, and, and one can imagine that a lesbian mother might have tremendous anxiety about having a healthy child, and you know, uh, and proving that the child isn't going to be whatever, you know, uh, warped and twisted. And all these things I just read. So there's a lot going on there. Thank you, thank you. Sam, uh, yeah, yeah. Hi, Teresa. Teresa. Um, this is just a test, just to give a testament about the power of the mothers interject into the baby about who you're going to be. I've been given some consideration to this. I was a lesbian baby. I'm so sure of it because I'm like totally lesbian woman today. Yay! <laughs> but you know, I, I, my self couldn't take in and be what my mom wanted me to be. 18 months later, my br brother was born. Her need to put that into someone fell into him. He became the little girl that I was supposed to be. He went to dance classes and loved it. He twirled a baton like nobody's business. He was a cheerleader. He could do a split. He could do all the backflips. He was, well, to this day, he's like, you know, every heterosexual woman's dream because he goes out shopping buys his wife not only all the outfits, but the jewelry to go with it, you know. But, I mean, I'm just, you know, I really believe that, that the power, the psychic power of the mother in this instance, in terms of trying to put on to the child, is that powerful, that it can jump genders. Because, you know, as Piaget tells us, you're a blank slate and you become. And I just really, I just wanted to share that because I think it's astounding. Mm, wow, thank you. Yeah, we can sort of see those, see that at work if we start to look for it. Um, but it hasn't been looked for too much historically, so it's great to start to look for it. Um, let's see. So I wanted to talk about um, like one, a couple of uh, the theorists, a couple of the theorists who have um, theorized about these early relationships. Um, um, and um, I wanted to start with Winnicott. Do, do people know Winnicott at all? Um, he's like, he was a pediatrician. Um, he's an object relations theorist, and he was a pediatrician, and he saw thousands and thousands and thousands of mothers and babies and infants. And his theory arises out of his having observed the interactions between mothers and babies. Um, and he, um, he, he was really the first one to really, uh, one of the first ones to really advocate for the baby's point of view. Um, and, and he was the first one to really say, the mother really makes a difference. Um, that before that, there was really the, the position um, that was being put forth by the object relations people was more like, uh, um, it's all inside, which is really important because it is all inside in some way. But what the, env the environment makes a difference about what's inside. Um, and he was the first one to really talk about that there needs to be good mothering or good enough mothering um, for the baby to become who the baby's supposed to be. So um, Winnicott had this really cool idea um, that he called primary maternal preoccupation. And um, this idea is that <sighs> I can feel in my body as I start to talk about this, my infant, because this is like about newborn, this is like what happens just before birth and at the time of birth. And uh, um, so... What, what does that feel like? Um, what that feels like?
feels like in for me, body. in my body, is um, a, a terror, actually. My experience of this particular uh, period of my life is a terror. terror. Yeah. And Winnicott says that um, what's supposed to happen in the first uh, few weeks of the baby's um, after the baby is born is the baby is supposed to enter into this feeling state called going on being. Winnicott's like the poet of <laughs> He's so groovy. I, you just have to read him because he's, uh, he's got such a beautiful feeling function and when you read him, not when you read him, when I read him, I feel like I'm going to force you, you have to see him my way, but when I, when I read him, I feel so held uh, by his maternal gaze, really. Um, and he has this idea that the baby comes, is in this, the baby needs to be in this state called going on being. And what that is, as I understand it, um, because it certainly wasn't my experience, um, but I've had moments after lots of years of working with my, uh, with these disturbances of, in my psyche to of feeling it, and it's a kind of, there's a sense that um, the world is completely safe. You're one with, you're one with the world, and all that matters is sort of what's arising in, in every moment, and it's, um, there's this, it's, it's like you're a river, and you're, you're flowing in the river, and the river is you, and you are the river of life, and it's all, uh, everything that arises is absolutely perfect. Everything that arises in you, in the baby, is absolutely perfect. The every need, uh, every hunger, uh, every need for holding, every need for touch, all of these needs are experienced, they're not even experienced as needs, they're because the need is met. And therefore this sense of oneness with existence. And, and to have that uh, creates a foundation for being, uh, for existential being that um, is profound for the rest, for the rest of the, the person's life. Uh, and what he says about um, what needs to happen for that to go, to happen, for, for going on being, to come online, as it were, is that the mother has to fall into this illness called primary maternal preoccupation. He calls it an illness. Um, because essentially she has to completely lose herself in the baby. And that, and she has to be able to completely identify with the baby's needs and to just be completely in the baby, uh, in the baby's experience in the most profound intuitive way. And Winnicott actually says it needs to be perfect. Only for a couple of weeks, but it needs to be perfect. And if it isn't, and depending on the degree to which it isn't, where the baby's need arises or the mother comes in out of tune with the baby. The baby experiences that. The, the infant self experiences that as an impingement on existence. And that impingement is actually experienced as a threat of annihilation of the self. So if the mother is um, misattuned to the baby and has her own narcissistic needs, her own demands, her own whatever is going on, and she, if she cannot succumb to this primary maternal preoccupation and allow herself to be lost in the baby's experience, um, then what happens is the baby, uh, instead of having this lovely going on being, um, has this sense of, uh, I'm, my, I'm being threatened by my annihilation ongoingly. And it is at the found, it becomes that, that sense of threat of uh, annihilation gives rise to, uh, there's, then there's not a safe environment for the baby, and it gives rise to, um, the baby attempts then to create a, um, to a substitute holding environment.
through thinking, through the baby's own mind, to create what, what should be being provided by the outer environment. Instead, there's like a split between the body, because the baby only is the body when the baby is born.